For reference, I work as a barista in a coffee shop inside a larger store. I'm one of a handful of male baristas at my shop. I am gay and very open about this. I wear pride shoes, I have a pride flag attached to my name tag, and I have a couple of wristbands with rainbows and phrases like Orlando Strong and a local LGBT plus center. So the other day I was working my shift at the register. A gentleman comes up to me and smiles. I think he knows the pride flag on my name tag, but he didn't explicitly mention it at first. He says he doesn't know what to order and asks me for my opinion. Now, I am not particularly a coffee drinker, but I know what drinks fit what tastes, so I ask him what he likes and I try to give him recommendations. As I'm talking, I can tell he's paying more attention to me than what I'm saying, which I'm completely okay with. He was a shorter but well-built man, had beautiful eyes and a nice beard, basically the perfect dilf. Eventually he decides on a super sweet ice drink that we have and I go to make it for him. As I'm making the drink, one of my coworkers leans over and whispers, I think that customer just took a picture of you. That was a bit of a red flag, but I thanked her and kind of brushed it off. I give him his drink and he smiles. He points to the pride flag and says, I love that flag. Where can I get one of those? I laughed and said I got it from a pride event I went to a few years ago. He then said, Where can I get the person it's attached to? I immediately feel a rush and I start blushing, but trying to act professional, I brush it off. He eventually takes his drink and sits at one of the tables. I continue going out about my day, debating whether I should give in to this guy or not. Every now and then, I would glance at his table to see him looking at me. No matter when I looked, it seemed like he was looking at me. I started to get that weird feeling of heart eyes with red flags. Then I noticed that he hasn't taken a single drink out of his coffee. Remember, it was an ice drink so I could see the clear plastic cup. When I have a break and go to wipe down some of the tables, I stop by his table and ask if he didn't like the drink. And if not, I could make him a new one free of charge. He hands me the drink and mentions he's not sure if it's too sweet for him or not and asks me to try it. I politely decline, telling him I don't drink coffee. He's shocked and asks me why I'm working here and blah blah blah. As we're talking though, his questions start to change. So do you lift at all? No, not really. Well, how much do you think you could lift if you had to? Uh, the job requirement is 50 pounds, so I guess at least that much. Well, I learned that it's good to be able to lift at least half your body weight. How much do you weigh? Immediate red flags go off. There was something about the combination of the drink and the two questions that made me feel like I was being asked how much of a fight I'd be able to hold, especially if I was drugged. I've been drugged at a party before, and these things are red flags that I've learned to pick up on, so I kindly and quickly end the conversation and go back to cleaning up tables. As the hours go by, he continues to sit there, not drinking his drink. Other employees and a couple of managers ask if everything's okay, and he says he's perfectly happy. Every now and then, he takes a phone call, and at one point, I swear I can see a guy on his phone at a different part of the store talking opposite of the guy at the table. Suddenly, I start to feel like there are more eyes on me than I realize. I pull one of my managers to the back and tell them I'm getting weirder and weirder feelings about the guy, and the manager says we'll keep an eye on him. Now, I was closing on this shift... And so as we got closer and closer to closing time, I noticed him still sitting there. When the announcement that the store is closing in half an hour is made, he comes up to the counter and asks if he could walk me to my car after I get off. I tell him our closing duties take us at least 45 minutes after we close, and he says he'd be happy to wait. I politely decline, and he asks when I work next. I tell him I'm off for a couple of weeks. Well... And I feel like I should walk you to your car, especially if I might not be able to see you for a couple of weeks. No way. I politely decline and eventually he leaves. I finish my closing duties and head to the employee area. As soon as I get down there, I tell one of my managers about the situation and ask if I can take the side exit from the store. At our store, we exit out one of the main doors after we close, but 
There's a single door that we use to get into the building before we open and that managers use to get out after we close. He agrees and tells me he'd walk with me to my car to make sure I'm okay if I'm cool with waiting a little while. I am. So I walk out the side doors with a couple of managers. I get into my car and as I'm driving away, I see a large van with extremely tinted windows parked in front of the front door. The passenger window rolls down oh so briefly as I pass by, and I'm instantly able to make out that the passenger is the same cute but creepy customer, and there's clearly someone else in the driver's seat. There's no way to know for sure the customer's intentions or if maybe he was just coming from work or not, but I knew that I was not about to stay to figure out, and I took a long and winding path home that night. When I was in third grade, there was this girl in my class. She wasn't particularly liked by anyone as she was quite the bully and overall a rude person, even to adults. She was known for having anger issues and getting mad at people for what seemed like no reason. I was no exception. Her name was Carly. She had been mean to me in the past, but that didn't deter me from going to her house one day after she had been nice to me all day at school. Naive, I know. So before leaving school that day, I called my mom to ask if I was allowed to go to Carly's house. She said yes and to call her when I get there so I can give her the address. Now when I think back, I wonder if she had a bad feeling about the situation since she doesn't normally ask for the address and she isn't picking me up since Carly's house was about two blocks away. When I got there after calling my mom, of course, Carly insisted on making me look pretty a.k.a. wetting my hair and brushing it. I let her. Then she told me to close my eyes and that she was taking me to the living room. I closed my eyes and she began to guide me towards the bathtub. We were already in the bathroom, so the tub was a solid two feet away from where we were standing. I opened my eyes just enough to see where she was guiding me. My foot hit the side of the tub and I said that this doesn't feel like the living room. She said it was and that I just need to step over the gate. I tell her that I know this is the bathtub. She stops trying to get me into the tub and brings me to the kitchen instead. She says she's going to make cereal. I was standing behind her when she reached into her dishwasher and said she was grabbing a spoon. The way that she clarified that she was grabbing a spoon immediately told me what she was really going to grab and it was for sure not a spoon. I can still remember the feeling of dread that overcame me when she said those words. She pulls out a large knife and backs me up into a counter, holding the knife only inches away from my neck. I can't remember if any words were exchanged during this, maybe I was just too shocked to say anything. I only stayed there for maybe 30 seconds before I pushed her aside and ran towards the door. I grabbed my backpack and put on my winter boots. By the time I had my boots on, Carly was trying to block the sliding door. I rushed past her again and flung open the door. I ran down her patio steps and out her front gate, not bothering to close it. I just wanted to get home to where I was safe. I remember her yelling at me as her dog escaped through the open gate. I didn't care. One of her neighbors who was in their front lawn waved and smiled at me, clearly oblivious to what had just gone down. I ran down the road into my house, not stopping once. It wasn't until I was in the door of my house that I broke down. I began to cry and yell for my mom. My two older sisters yelling at me to shut up. My mom walked over to me and immediately knew something was wrong. I explained what happened and she was very understanding and freaked out. I can't remember if it was the same day or the next day that I had to talk to a police officer about what had happened. He asked me what kind of knife it was and what not. I think my mom relayed most of the story to him because I don't remember having to say much. They got in contact with Carly's foster mom and Carly got in big trouble for it. At the school, Carly yelled at me for getting the cops involved and tried to guilt trip me by saying that her mom threatened to put her back in foster care if she did anything like that again. I told her I didn't care. The school was also notified of the situation and the teachers were made sure to keep an extra eye on her, but that didn't mean I wasn't paranoid around her. 
I made sure to keep my guard up for the rest of the school year. Which was true. She had it coming. I always thought that it was a bit extreme to involve the cops, but I ended up making Carly never mess with me again. I ended up moving after that year for unrelated reasons, only to move back before I started 6th grade. The first day of middle school I was awaiting for them to call my name so I knew which class is my homeroom when I hear an all too familiar name, Carly, and then her last name. I watch as no one goes up to join the class. Was she not here? Next I was called. I go up to join the class that she would have been in. I found out later when the teacher was doing attendance that she had moved three hours away just before the beginning of the school year. It's been three years since then and I can only hope that she doesn't come back. But if she does, I'm not too concerned. And if she does, I'll make sure that she stays away from me. That incident has given me some trust issues, but at least now I know to choose my friends wisely. So this was about five months ago. I don't remember it with complete clarity and I'm not the best at telling story events from my life, but bear with me. This is about 2 a.m. in downtown Denver. A friend of ours hosts a D&D session every Sunday. Me and my partner normally stay the night, but we had plans the next Monday and had to go early. We say our goodbyes to everyone and grab our bags and head out. It wasn't a long walk at all to the car, not even a block away. Me and my significant other started walking and chatting about the session. Then we both got silent at the same time. Someone was behind us. I don't know how, but we both knew he was going to be bad news. He continued to follow us to the parking garage, and right before we entered, he spoke up with a, Are you ladies 18 or older? Now, I'm a bigger girl, 5'10", and more than knew how to hold my own against creeps. This guy struck me as different. He was a good foot taller than me, blonde blue-eyed male with one heck of a disgusting smile. Me being the dumb polite person I am, I said something like, Um, yes, why? And he proceeded to start saying things like, Do you pay your taxes? With a quick response of, Sorry, we aren't really at that stage of our lives yet. He quickly responds with a long rant about how taxes are terrible You should never pay them, you're using our taxes to kill people all the time. The government is killing people, everyone's killing people, and they get away with it so easily. At this point, he begins to move closer and closer to us. My partner's backing up into the garage, and my dumb self is too scared to move, just trying to keep him focused on myself rather than her. He gets within a few inches of my face. I try to casually step away, keep my movements looking natural, and straighten my back out compensating for the fact that this person is larger than me. His breath was horrible. You could smell the alcohol with every single word that came out of his mouth and his blue wristband was still on. Don't know if that's a bar thing, all I know is he had one. He continues on with his rant. My significant other tries to argue back a bit. He starts to move away from me towards her. After a few glances between me and her, we catch on that we just need to go with whatever this guy says. When she stops arguing, his rant goes from taxes to political figures and genocide. You know, I could kill anyone I want and get away with it. Anyone. Anyone can. The government is watching you, but they don't care. They'll never know. His words were not making sense at all. We're killing this planet, and it all could be solved if we just had less of a population. Mind you, this guy was back in my face, staying as close as possible. If either of us went on our phone or our washes, he'd shift to them. Not to compliment him, but he was really perceptive for someone I assume was drunk out of their mind. The conversation continues for about five, maybe ten minutes. It felt like an hour, though. I felt disgusted with myself for it, but I'm agreeing with everything he's saying at this point. He seemed to completely forget about my significant other. I introduced myself using my character name and shake his hand which allowed me to see a bunch of track marks on his arm. I'm freaking out on the inside, thinking I'm going to get stabbed today. I've never even been in a fight. How do I handle this? 
all the while smiling and agreeing. Then his behavior shifted, still staying way too close to me he starts scratching himself all over, reaching into his left pocket over and over every time he references ending someone's life. Honestly at this point I was more angry than scared and started trying to work around him as stepping back was just leading me to a wall. It wasn't working no matter how I tried to walk or where I tried to go, he was always right there in my face talking about hurting people. He wanted that it would solve the world's problems if people just went out and just hurt a few hundred others. I got fed up with it, stepped to my right then quickly to his left and backed up straight out of the garage. He followed, so did my partner behind him. We were finally out in the open again. I sent so many desperate looks to people walking by as he kept getting more and more pushy and ever closer to me so much as he was almost chest to chest with me. I don't know what came over me, but I grabbed my significant other's arm. Missed it by a long shot, she said, what I mustered the best smile I could, and said, I just wanted to hold your hand. As a gay person, either a few homophobic and crazy people encounters, this was the worst idea ever. She handed me her hand, though I pulled her by me, and this man that seemed like a huge threat backed up so quickly, saying, Oh, you two are together. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Yeah, have a great, day, great night. This boy had been doing whatever he was doing turn tail because we were gay. The one time my preference has ever probably saved me rather than put me in danger. We waited until he was far up the street then went straight to the car. The second we got in we locked the doors and drove off. I was shaking the whole car ride home. We actually passed him and saw him twitching later on down the road. Me and him made direct eye contact. It was around 1.30pm when my dog started barking for me to take him outside. I put him on his leash and walked outside my first floor apartment, leaving the door unlocked behind me like I had done a million times before. Seriously, I never thought twice about it as I live in a really safe neighborhood in an extremely safe, almost boring town. In my 27 years of living here, nothing had ever tested that sense of security before. My dog is 15, so he moves a little slow and really loves taking his time sniffing around. He'll usually stop and pee three different times and that day was no different, but suddenly a big white truck filled with lawn equipment slowed down in front of me. Hey, make sure you pick up after your dog. I looked up and saw a man in his late forties or so wearing polarized sunglasses and a bandana around his lower mouth and neck. Uh, he just peed. I responded with a little bit of an attitude, like, thanks, I got this, now drive away. I looked up again and he gave me a wink and lowered his bandana to blow me a kiss before he drove off. He instantly made me feel uncomfortable. But as a young Hispanic female, I had been used to older Hispanic men being inappropriate and making me feel like that for years. It's just a sad reality. So once again, I thought nothing of it. I was walking back to my apartment when a woman came out of her apartment in the next building over and stood on her patio motioning for me to come to her. Now, I've never met this lady. I had seen her around the complex and she seemed nice enough, but ultimately I didn't know this woman. I've watched Dateline. I'm not going up on her patio. I asked her what she wanted and she just insisted I go over there so she could tell me. I told her I needed to bring my dog back inside but maybe I could help her from outside where I was if she just told me. Next thing I know this woman is freaking running towards me. I picked up my dog ready to run home myself and then she stopped probably five feet away from me. Please listen to me. A man walked into your apartment while you were walking your dog. I think he was one of the mowers. I was sitting in my car when I saw him walk in and I know you live there alone. I called 911. They're on the way. I could feel my face burning as I tried to process what I'd just heard. I'd watched the man I had talked to drive away. I didn't see his truck anywhere. How could that be possible? What I didn't realize was that while I was talking to him, he had positioned his truck right in line of sight of my apartment. 
I couldn't see my door so I was distracted and looking away while another man walked in. If my neighbor hadn't happened to be sitting in her car on the phone, I would have walked into my apartment completely unaware that someone would be inside waiting to do God knows what. I'm so thankful she was so observant even prior to the incident because she knew there shouldn't be anyone else in that apartment and had a gut feeling something was wrong. The police arrived not even five minutes later and arrested the guy. He said he had my permission to use my restroom, which was obviously not true. Since my door was unlocked and we can't prove for sure what his intentions were when he entered, he was only charged with trespassing. That's a misdemeanor in my state and he did no jail time, which obviously freaked me out because this guy knew where I lived. The man driving the truck technically did nothing wrong, but it's scary to think that they might have been working together. I stayed with my parents until we were able to find a legal loophole to get out of my lease and move out of that apartment. I moved into a house with an old friend and got a ring system installed that same day. My dog has a backyard now. My dad mows the lawn for us and I still get coffee with the neighbor who called the cops for me. This happened about two years ago. I was hanging out with my friend Ivana at a bar in Manassas. It was around 9pm and we were just chatting and getting a few drinks. She was telling me about a guy she's been talking to on Tinder. She showed me his photos and a glimpse of their conversation. His name was Omar and he seemed like your average guy. He was pretty attractive. They've been talking for a few days now and haven't met up yet. She tried several times to get him to text her outside of the app but he would give her the same excuse. I want to give up my number to a stranger I haven't met yet. It's a bit unusual but totally understandable so I told her that he's being smart. She was on looking at her phone for a few minutes and then squeaked, Oh my god. I started giggling and asked her, Jesus, what was that? Did he send you like a wiener pick or something? She laughed, No, but Omar wants to meet. I told her to go for it and if she wants I can leave. She said, He wants me to come over to his house. I immediately said, Oh no. She seemed to agree and continued to respond to Omar. I was now hesitant of leaving because a part of me is scared that she would change her mind. I told her to tell him to meet her at the hookah bar across the street. She thought it'd be weird to meet him with me with her. I told her I'll head over there after and act like I don't know her and just sit across from her. She said okay and left. It was now 10.20 and it's been about 15 minutes since she left. I proceeded to go across the street. I entered the hookah bar and after ordering my blueberry mint hookah I looked around trying to find her. I saw her sitting at the table closest to the door across from Omar. I sat at the table across from them and started smiling from excitement because I found this whole thing so entertaining. I have a great view of her face and his back. Ivana seemed to be happy and laughing while talking to him. She was really cute. I got my hookah and I just sat there playing with my phone. I was texting my boyfriend and telling him what was going on. While it was mid-typing, I got a text from Ivana. Amy, I don't know about this. I looked up and saw her face. She seemed pretty uncomfortable. Being the nosy friend that I was, I asked what's wrong, and she responds, He keeps asking me to come home with him. I smirked and responded, Ooh, he's trying to get some. She wasn't looking at her phone for a couple of minutes and I saw her stand up. She smiled at him and headed towards the bathroom, and she called me. Amy, I need to freaking leave now. The smile disappeared from my face and I started to worry. She seemed genuinely scared. Whoa, what's going on? He asked me like ten times to come over, and when I kept saying no, he laughed and said, Don't make me kidnap you. He's probably joking, but I don't know. He's probably just joking, but... That's still pretty creepy. Amy, what do I do? I was about to answer when I saw Omar get up and walk towards the bathroom. I thought he was just going to the men's room, but that's when things got weird. He stopped right outside of the ladies' room and put his ear to it. Ivana, don't say anything else. He's right outside your door. 
At this point, I knew something is definitely wrong with this guy and we need to get out of there. He took his ear off the door and sat back down at the table. I reassured her that things were going to be okay because I was here and that we'll leave soon. Ivana came out of the bathroom shortly after and sat down in her seat. After a couple of more minutes of forced awkward conversation between them, it was time to leave. I saw them get up to pay and walk out the door. I got up to pay then left. I walked by the both of them standing at the front and just went straight to my car. I just watched them from my car making sure she's okay. I couldn't hear anything but from what I could tell she seemed to be fake smiling and I think trying to leave. She pulled out her phone and I saw him snatch it. He held it in the air laughing as she was trying to grab it back. He then started to walk backwards toward a blue car I assumed was his. She wasn't smiling anymore and her face was clearly upset. I rolled down my window to listen since there are now only a couple of cars in front of me. Stop playing around, give me back my phone. Get in the car, Ivana. What? No, give me my phone back already. Get in the car now. I can see her crying now and all I could think was this had gone too far. I jumped out of the car and called my boyfriend. I walked straight to them and with my boyfriend on speakerphone I yelled at him. Give her her phone back and get out of here. He seemed startled and asked me who I was. Ivana was shaken up at this point, but all I could feel was rage. I'm her friend, and I've been here the whole time. My boyfriend's on his way. If you don't give her her phone back and leave before he gets here, then I swear to God, you're going to be screwed. He handed her phone back and started laughing. I was just joking around. Jesus. He got in his car and left. I finally calmed Ivana down and let her spend the night at my place. We thought about calling the police, but we saw that he had deleted his tinder. I was upset that my idiot self didn't bother to get his license plate. I'm not even sure if Omar was his real name. She told me that she paid for the hookah, so we didn't even have his credit card info. I've learned a lot of things from this scary situation in my life. This taught me that unless you know someone very well always meet in public and it never hurts to have a friend close by. This is a bit of an older story as I'm in my late 20s now and this happened while I was in high school as a junior. When I was 17 I was dating a kid who went to the same regional high school as me. He lived in the city that was next to my small town, so the kind of environment we were used to were completely different. You could walk barefoot down the street in my town or leave your front door unlocked at night. You could definitely not do that where he was from. One day our school has an early release day and myself and my boyfriend, we'll call him D, and his friend Jay all decided to walk to Jay's house to hang out. It was a long walk from the school to Jay's house. But it was in broad daylight and there were three of us so we didn't feel uncomfortable walking through the rougher parts of the city. I paid close attention to the route we took. Walking along a busy and populated street with storefronts through an alley and in back of an old factory building repurposed to hold a boutique and a sports supply shop through an area with some construction. I'm normally bad with directions but these landmarks helped me to figure out the path we took. We finally arrive at Jay's house and get some snacks, hang out at a local playground to use the swings, then Jay has to leave to go to guitar practice and Dee and I hang on our own for a bit. Dee eventually gets a call from his mom saying that he has to come home because of some dumb reason. His mom was pretty unstable and would ground him for the dumbest reason sometimes. This time she said that he hadn't told her he was going to hang out with friends after school, even though he did, and to come home immediately. D was pretty used to nonsense like this from his mom and was convinced that if he just went home really quickly and talked to her, that he could come right back to the park to hang out with me. He had me stay at the park because if he had brought me back with him, it would likely make her more angry. Well, things didn't go so well and he hasn't been allowed to come back and get me, and I'm left on my own. So now I'm in this park in the middle of the city by myself. Okay, I say to myself, I know how to get back. Just go to the landmarks. This is how I have to navigate. I start working my way backwards through the streets we took through the construction area, 
past the factory building, through the alley. It was daytime, but these were supposed to be the most sketchy areas our trip took us through. I made it through them just fine. I finally came to the busy street with the shops. Cars passed every few seconds and there were people coming in and out of the shops almost constantly. It was broad daylight and the area was well kept and neat. It should have been the safest way to go home, right? As I'm making my way on the sidewalk, a car pulls down a side street in front of me. I think that he's trying to merge onto the main street and into the traffic, so I stop to let him go. Instead of pulling forward, he rolls down the window. It's an older man, maybe early 60s. No real discerning features other than short gray hair. Seems normal enough, and he speaks to me. Excuse me, do you know how I would get to Jefferson Street? I'm not from the city, so I honestly wouldn't know how to give him directions. But it's a pretty well-known street. There were tons of major businesses on that street. It seemed weird for an adult not to know how to get there. It was like not knowing how to get to Main Street. But I was a kid who didn't drive, so I didn't know. No, sorry, I don't. Are you sure you don't know how to get there? No, sorry. He pauses. Why don't you get into my car with me and... You can show me how to get there. Wait, what? Now, if you've ever been in a weird situation like this, you might be familiar with that time stop sensation. It's like you're looking at everything from far away for a moment and you can take everything in. In this moment, I'm thinking a few things. This guy just pulled up on a 17-year-old girl in broad daylight on a busy street. He's blocking my path. I just told him I don't know how to get to Jefferson Street, but he's now asking me to get into his car to show him how to get to Jefferson Street. What? Those little red flags are popping up everywhere. The buzzers and sirens and stranger danger lessons my parents taught me since I was in primary school are screaming in my brain, and if this guy's weird vibes didn't show up before, they were now. I didn't like what I was feeling. This guy was either a creep or just completely senile. I looked at the old man and am very wary of him. A part of me is telling me to turn around and walk away. Sorry, I can't. I'm gripping the strap of my backpack. His face changes. I had never actually seen this kind of thing happen before, where someone's face actually makes a shift, and this is the only time I've ever seen it. He immediately looks angry. He doesn't seem like a senile old man anymore. He yells, Get in the car! He confirmed the bad feelings in my stomach. For me, the adrenaline is now flowing, and I'm both scared and angry at the balls of this old man. I don't know why this came to mind, but all I could do was scream at him to screw off. I'm standing on the sidewalk with my backpack, there's barely anything in it other than my phone, notebook, and some toiletries. There's nothing I can use to defend myself. I'm trying to figure out how big this old man could be, but I can't tell. I'm 126 pounds soaking wet at this age with little upper body strength. I don't know if I can do anything if he decides to get out of the car. He's by himself, but what if he has a knife? I have to go in front or behind his car to keep taking this route home. If I do, will he try to hit me? Will he try to knock me down or back over me with his car? It felt like all these thoughts were happening in an instant and I was confused. I just want to go home. He stares at me from inside the car with this look of anger, but he doesn't say anything. It's just silent between other than the sound of the cars going by and he's just staring. It was only like this for a few seconds, but it felt like forever. Once the road is clear, he peeled out into traffic and was gone. I was left standing on the sidewalk of that busy street, confused, tired, and shaking with adrenaline. I just keep thinking to myself over and over again, what was that? I'm not sure whatever happened to that man. I'm sure he had some sort of plan figured out. Find a girl, ask her how to get to a well-known street, let her list off the directions, Pretend to be a feeble old man that needs help getting there, then hope she's naive enough to accept your request of being the co-pilot. I don't think he was counting on someone not knowing how to get to that street. I really hope he didn't go on to 
perfect this method and use it on some girl or boy in the future. I think back on this now and I wonder if I would have reacted differently. I wish I had seen his license plate at least. I don't think that just because you're on a busy street in broad daylight that you're safe or that nothing could happen to you. Keep your eyes peeled, be prepared, and don't worry about not being polite. When your gut is telling you something is up, listen. For context, I'm a girl and the major part of the story happened when I was in 8th grade. I lived in the same house from the age of 4 until I turned 21. It was a duplex, meaning there were two houses on the same property with a large backyard. Our property manager had turned part of his garage into a small bedroom and had rented it out to a man. My family moved into the home closest to the backyard when I was 4. My dad, being the friendly guy he is, made friends with a man living in the small bedroom across from our home. This man was older, maybe in his late 40s or early 50s, always reeked of alcohol and cigarettes, wore glasses and had crooked teeth, the works. Over the years, he'd watch me closely, in a creepy way. He'd only leave his door cracked open about an inch and I'd see his glasses gleam as he watched me play with friends or by myself. He would always try to tempt me to come to him with money or candy. As I got older, I started inviting my middle school friends to my home. A few of them would comment on the weird man staring at us. I remember a time where I said, he's staring at us again, and one of my friends responded with, he's not staring at us, he's watching you. My best friend is Karen. Karen and I have always been super invested in Naruto. We'd always watched it in our spare time together. One of the characters, Jiraiya, was a super pervert who would lurk around women. Naruto called him Pervy Sage so we started calling the creepy old man Pervy Sage as well. Sorry, Jiraiya. Late one night, maybe at around 8pm or 9pm, when I was about 13 or 14, Karen and I were in my dining room area, sitting at the computer with my dog on my lap. My parents were at work. My older brothers were in their room. They shared the master bedroom. They were hanging out with their friends. I recall hearing my front door open but not thinking much of it. That's until I smelled the stench of cigarettes and alcohol. We looked to our left and saw him inside my home, but neither of us said anything. Karen and I were both in shock. He walked up to us and stood behind me. He began to play with my hair, asking what we were doing. Karen and I just sat there, not knowing what to say. He knew my parents weren't home. She blurted out we were ordering pizza online and typed in Pizza Hut on the search bar. She later told me if we ordered pizza, a grown-up would come and we could tell him or her what was wrong. The man did not budge. He continued to play with my hair. Karen got up and nervously said, I'm going to ask your brothers if they want anything on their pizza. And with that, she ran to her right, straight down the hallway and bolted through my brother's door. I had just finalized the pizza purchase and heard her scream, Pervy Sage is acting weird. The man only spoke Spanish, I doubt he knew what she said, but with that I grabbed my dog and ran towards my brother's room and repeated it. Pervy Sage is acting weird. Both Karen and I were blurting out how weird he was being and how he came in uninvited. I can imagine we both looked hysterical. My brothers told us to get the F out of their room. I'm not sure if they were trying to look cool in front of their friends, but I knew how they were. If I didn't do as they asked, I'd get beat up or told off. Karen and I looked at each other, sort of defeated. We closed their bedroom door and stood in front of it for a second. We looked back at where we originally sat, but the man was not there. Karen and I ran to the kitchen, grabbed two knives and ran into my bedroom and locked the door. She sat on the bed with my dog and I sat on the floor, trying to listen or feel if he was walking around my house. My house was old. It would easily shake when someone walked around, so I felt if I sat on the floor, I'd feel it if he were inside. My bedroom had two doors, one with a lock that connected to the hallway, the other with no lock connected to my parents' room, which was right next to the front door of the house. Karen and I heard his footsteps in the living room once more than silence. We both looked at each other in horror. 
We both rushed to the second door and pushed against it just in time to stop him from opening it. The man pushed for about 30 seconds before stopping. The moment he stopped, Karen and I took the opportunity to push a dresser in front of the door to barricade it. About 50 minutes of us sitting on my bed, knives in hand, we heard the pizza guy arrive. With that, the man was gone, back in his hole of a bedroom outside my home. We locked the front door and ate our pizza. We didn't call the police because of where we lived, we thought, who'd believe two kids? A few days later, Karen and I reported everything to our school counselor. She was an amazingly caring woman. She was always there for us no matter what we needed, so we trusted her enough to tell her what had happened. She made a full report and interviewed us both separately to make sure we weren't lying. She called us both into her office the next day and let us know that she had called the police to report the incident, but they told her, we cannot do anything until something actually happens. Karen was furious. Are we supposed to be found dead in a ditch for them to do something? I can still hear her saying this to this day. Our counselor called our parents to report the incident. Karen's parents didn't seem to care. Their divorce was more important. My dad asked if it was true and said he talked to the guy. My brothers came to me saying, If he comes near you, you tell us. And all of a sudden, they cared. My dad remained friends with the man. The man stopped talking to me for years but never stopped watching. When I was 16, Karen and I were hanging out near the front of the property. The man had ridden his bike near us and said, Your attitude has changed. He said this in Spanish. This was the first time he said anything to me since the event two or three years prior. So I told him, I'm not a kid anymore. I know what you are. And I can fight back. Karen glared at him. He moved away shortly after. Karen and I lost touch after he moved away. We both went to different high schools and for the first two years we tried our hardest to remain in contact, but we grew apart. That and her mom had her moving from place to place after the divorce. I grew up with trust issues around men due to that man. Just something I'm slowly trying to get over. I'm 24 now. The last time I saw him I was in my dad's car and he was riding his bike down the street, but that was back when I was about 18. I haven't seen him since. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.